Well, <clears throat> well, good evening. I tell you what, let's all get up and walk around and greet one another in the love of the Lord. Let's do that right now. Come. <clears throat> And just say to one another that the Lord bless you. If you struggle to get up because of food problems or whatever, uh, you may remain seated. But greet someone you have never greeted before for a long, long time. Right? Walk around and greet someone you don't know. Thank you so much all right, for greeting one another. Um, we continue and I want to finish my series with you on the book of Philippians today. Just now when the, <coughs> when the passages were read, verses 10 to 13, um, Paul emphasized that he had learned to be content. Whether he had a lot or whether he was in need. And then he went on to thank his friends in Philippi for their gift. And now we go on from here, all right, verses 14 onwards, just to give a quick introduction. In verses 14 to 20, he affirms them for their friendship. But not just for their friendship, but also for their faithfulness to, to the gospel the ministry of the gospel. All of this is cause for worship. And that's why when we come to verse 20, Paul begins to worship the Lord. He thinks about all that God has done through the Philippians and of the faithfulness in their lives. And that simply means the deep work that God has done in each one of them. And as he writes, he suddenly says, wow, God, I worship you. Then verses 21 to 22, he sends his own greetings to everyone uh, in Philippi. And then he closes verse 23 and his letter with a blessing. That was normally Paul's style of writing. <clears throat> I want to thank my brother just now for worship leading just now. You may or may not have realized it that two of his songs were from the book of Philippians. All right, and um, we thank God for that. Thank you, brother. So let's go now into the text. Thank you. I need your help all the way. Thank you. Okay, let's read it together. I, I know our sister Michelle read it, but let's read it together. Ready, one, two. Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. You see, the Philippians reached out to Paul when they came to know that he was imprisoned in Rome for his faith in Christ. And so they gave him a gift. What was, what was so special about the gift? It wasn't so much the size of the gift but rather it was an expression to Paul. It was their way of openly saying <clears throat> to Paul, we love you because Paul was being persecuted for his faith. He was imprisoned and they wanted to say, Paul, we love you. You know, sometimes when we want to give a gift, we, we feel a bit shy now because we feel our gift is too small. But Paul didn't see it that way. He saw it as an expression that here are this group of believers, they too were going through persecution. They too were struggling financially. 
they, threw, they, they too were going through tough times. And out of all of that, what little they had, they collected it together and they gave it to their brother Paul, who was also going through persecution. Are you with me, church? And that really is amazing. Why? Because the Philippine believers could have said, well, you know, times are tough, and we are struggling financially. Many of them, their businesses had been closed down because they were Christians, and people were boycotting their business. You know what is happening in this country, all right? Imagine that happening in Philippi. Oh, this person is a Christian. Don't go to his shop. The shop will close. Or oh, this person is a Christian, sacked from the shop. And so these Philippine Christians were the last people who could give. But despite all their struggles, they refused to become self-centered and stingy. On the contrary, they chose to love and stand by the Apostle Paul. Next slide, please. <coughs> Ready? One, two. Paul gives a brief historical record of their outstanding financial support. Again, I want to say it wasn't a huge amount, but it is a record not of the giving alone, but a record of their faithfulness in standing with Paul. Acts chapter 16 verse 11 to chapter 17 verse 34 will give the background to what was happening. So let's take a quick look and what happened in the past. Next slide. All right, so from Troas, Paul sailed and then they came to Philippi. Soon after they arrived at Philippi, several people, including Lydia, converted to the Christian faith. But very soon after that, they experienced persecution. But God miraculously delivered them and, but they were actually beaten. They were put into prison and God set them free and brought them out of prison. The leaders of the city were terrified when they realized that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens and had been beaten up without a fair trial. They appealed to Paul and Silas and begged them to leave the city of Philippi. Next slide, please. So leaving Philippi, they traveled all the way to Thessalonica. Thessalonica was the administrative capital of the Macedonian province. And in, almost immediately, people began to give their lives to Christ. But many Jews, many Jews and God-fearing Gentiles gave their life, to, believed in the Lord. But there was violent persecution in Thessalonica. One, one Christian, newborn Christian was beaten up. So within three to four weeks, huh, less than a month in Thessalonica, Paul and Silas had to go again. Next slide. So they went, sorry, okay, it's working now. Thank God. Okay, so they went from there to Berea. So they went to Berea, they began to preach, the people there began to listen, but some of the Jews, the jealous Jews from Thessalonica came and stirred up trouble again. Paul, next, had, next, oh, I got it here. All right, they had to go from Berea, and then the green, okay, here we are. And then they went by ship probably, Paul went to Athens. You remember in Athens, he had very little fruit in his ministry there. Next slide. I, you are betting it. And then from there, 
We are not sure how he made it, but he went from Athens to Corinth, whether by sea or we traveled by the land route. We are not sure. And there in Corinth, he stayed a year and a half. And while he was still in Corinth, of course, you know, he was concerned. But the thing here is this. The believers in Philippi, they were very young in their faith. And immediately, they began to support the Apostle Paul in his ministry of preaching the gospel. And we read that in, in Philippians 4, verse 15. In fact, when Paul was in Thessalonica for less than one month, we know that the Philippians sent gifts to Paul at least twice. Can you imagine? Less than a month, he went out of Philippi, the Philippians started sending money to support the ministry. At least twice. And in Corinth, when he was struggling financially, one year and a half, he was struggling financially. They reached out to him with more financial support. Even though they probably didn't know. Those days there was no WhatsApp, email. You know, you send a letter, it might never reach there. If it reaches, it might take a year to get there. So they probably didn't know. But they felt moved. We are going to support Paul. And so Paul valued these timely gifts at least once when he was in Corinth. He was struggling. And that is why he gently rebuked when he wrote to the Corinthians some years later. He rebuked the Corinthian believers. Why? Let me, let's go to the next slide, please. This is taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verses 8 to 9. I robbed other churches. Paul is saying to the Corinthians by taking wages from them to serve you and when I was present with you and was in need I was not a burden to anyone well, what is he saying he's basically saying I was in need huh? and none of you saw it that's the implication I was in need but I didn't want to be, I was not a burden to anyone. That means Paul covered it up very well. For when the brethren came from Macedonia, remember that is Philippi, Thessalonica, the two main cities in Macedonia, they fully supplied my need. Who are the brethren in, Thessalon in Macedonia? Philippian Christians, Thessalonian Christians, both were suffering persecution but they made it a point to sacrifice so that Paul could be supplied all his needs. And in everything, I kept myself from being a burden to you and will continue to do so. Paul uses that word robbed up there, first line, second word, in a figurative sense. His point is that he received money from the Philippian Christians who were the people who could least afford to give, but they gave. He did this only because he did not want to burden the Corinthian believers. But here's the crunch. In all probability, Bible scholars tell us the Corinthian church was not poor. They were a rich church. But he didn't want to support Paul. You see, both Paul and the, and the Philippians had experienced the amazing love of God through Jesus Christ. And the Philippians expressed this love for God and for Paul by supporting him financially. Indeed, over the long, over his ministry, the Philippians faithfully stood with him and kept supporting him. And that is one reason why the Philippian church was unique among all the churches that Paul had planted. They loved Paul. Paul loved him. And that's why I told you when I began this series, this is one letter from Paul where he rarely rebukes anyone. Because they, 
he, there was such a bonding between them. Next slide, please. But there is another point that comes up here. There is sacrificial giving. That means the giving of the Philippian believers was evidence that they were growing in maturity in Christ. Somebody has said it. When God has a man's heart or a woman's heart, he has also has their wallet or their purse. Okay. One of the first marks that a person has been saved, in my experience as a pastor, is generosity. Because they suddenly realize how much they have received from God through Jesus Christ. And out of that heart of gratitude, not that they are trying to earn it, but out of that heart of gratitude for the grace that we have received, they want to give. And again and again, as a pastor, I've seen when God touches a person, he touches their wallet as well. Amazing. Suddenly they say, Pastor, how can I support this group? Or what can I do to support? We seldom realize that our attitude to wealth and possessions will have a lasting impact on our lives on Christ as well. So it goes both ways. You know, when God touches our heart, He touches our wallet. But at the same time, the way we, as we give, as we don't hold back and we begin to give, it affects our relationship with God again. So both ways it works in a way. And that is why this church had a very special place in Paul's heart. But let's go on. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit which increases to your account. Having related their record of sacrificial giving, he knows that obviously uh, people say, you know, you did this for me, you gave me this, you gave me this, and then when I was there, you gave me some more. If you were listening to that, what's the first thing will come to your mind? You want some more, Paul. <laughs> if you want some more, Asla, don't say, say you gave, you gave. So he knows he can be mis misunderstood. That's why in verse 17 he says, I'm not looking for your gift. Earlier in verse 12, I think he says, he says, look, I'm not hard up for your gift, but I thank you for the gift. So again he says, I'm not seeking the gift, but I'm seeking the profit which increases to your account. You see, Paul says, what he wants is something far greater. He wants, you see, the New Testament writers all lived and wrote in the confident expectation that Jesus Christ would return. And Paul, we, we, as we think back, chapter 3, verse 20 to 21, Paul mentions that Jesus will return. And when he returns, Jesus will reward every believer accordingly. Jesus, there is going to be an accounting. That accounting is not about going to heaven or hell. That was already done at the cross. But we will have to give an account to Jesus Christ of what we have done with our Christian lives. What we have done in the context of our relationship with Christ. 1 Corinthians 3, Paul says, all right, Christ has laid the foundation. No doubt about that. Be careful how you build on it. Because if we build with gold, silver, and precious stones, Paul gives the idea, our works like gold, silver, and precious stones, noble, good, all right, as we do it for the glory of Christ, it will be tested as if it goes through a furnace and gold, silver, and precious stones can go through the fire. 
But if we build on that foundation that is Jesus Christ, and we build it with wood, hay, and stubble, guess what? Put the fire, God, ashes. And that is why you and I, we need to remember, and Paul was trying to tell them that as well, there is going to be an accounting. And Paul wants the Philippian Christians to know when that accounting is done, when Jesus returns, what you have done, my dear Philippians, will not be overlooked. Jesus said the same thing, even a glass of cold water given to a prophet will be rewarded. So what are we building on? But we must remember Jesus, when he comes back, will test what we have built on that foundation. That's why he wanted them to know and he wanted to encourage them. You see, the Philippians were poor. They went into voluntary destitution for the sake of the gospel. Paul wanted them to know, Jesus, this has not gone unnoticed. Jesus knows. Jesus knows. Jesus knows the sacrifices each one of us has made for the gospel. Jesus knows the pain, the tears, the effort, the perspiration, the financial cost, he knows. Jesus knows the, the time that we have put in into serving him in whatever way that we have served him. He knows. And Paul told that to the Philippians and he tells us today, it has not gone unnoticed. Our Father in heaven has noticed and it will be rewarded. Say to the person next to you, it will be rewarded and smile up. <laughs> Isn't that a good thought? You know, sometimes when you are serving God, you wonder, is this all worthwhile? How many of you have ever had that kind of thought before? Just be honest, come on, nobody here. Wow all super, super duper men and women of faith in Gregor Emmanuel Mark. Maybe I should stop preaching and go down and you all can come up here and preach. Thank you, my brother. Got one or two honest people here. <laughs> really? When we serve God, if you have ever, never, ever felt, is this all worthwhile, God? I don't know what to say, lah. I remember when I was on the Dulos, we were sailing through a, a typhoon. And one night, when, during the four or five nights of heavy sailing, you know, sometimes these waves, they, they what's the word for it? They uh, construct, they come together in a way that it becomes a big wave. And then the wave broke. You see, a ship is made in such a way, it'll bobble, you know, you put, a, you put an empty cup, it'll go up and down the waves. But if water gets into the cup, the cup will start to sink, right? That's why the ship has to be watertight now. So then what happened, so the ship was going up and down, but one wave came, and as it came, it broke. That means all that energy in that wave hit the ship on the side, not in the front. And then the ship went like this, I was like sleeping in my cabin, all right, and I could feel the whole ship going down. Above me was the pantry where all the pots and pans, boom, boom, chang, 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 you know, worse than Chinese New Year. <laughs> and it was going down and down and down. Because if it goes beyond a certain point, it will not come up. In that point, there was a split second thought, Lord, is this worth it? Because if the ship goes down in a typhoon, chances are more I would be dead. Most of us would die. 
And then slowly the ship began to rise up. Okay. Is it worth it? And the answer is a resounding yes. God sees. God sees. Next slide. So in summary, the financial gift itself was not important to Paul, really. What was most important was that the ongoing work of God in the lives of these young believers. And these financial gifts were the external evidence or expression of what God was doing in their hearts. Are you with me, church? Next slide. Let's read it together. Ready? One, two. stand up and read the text. <laughs> All right, sometimes I feel the preacher should be the one to sit down and everybody in the congregation stand up. I guarantee you, you won't fall asleep. And if you do fall asleep, you'll wake up instantly when your head hits the ground. <laughs> you don't know how many times I sit up, I stand up in churches, people are like, All right, so ready? Let's read it together. Ready, one, two. Amen. You may be seated. <laughs> so although he did not need the gift and he knew what it meant to be content <coughs> in every situation. Nevertheless, Paul deeply appreciated the kindness. He knew that Epaphroditus, we talked about him in Philippians chapter 2, verse 27, almost died as he came to bring the gift, made that gift even more precious. Someone almost died to bring the gift, the love, love gift to him. And Paul goes on to say with three phrases, fragrant aroma, all right, the second last line, fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well pleasing to God. He, these phrases were used in the law of Moses to describe the animal sacrifices in the tabernacle. It was the way of in ancient Israel, God told them, you want to come to worship me? This is the way you do it. But Paul wants them to know that their gifts are actually like the animal sacrifices in the Old Testament. Their gifts are worship to God. Yes, they were giving to him. But in giving to him and the work of the ministry, in the process, they were worshipping God. You see, church, when we drop money into that box there, it is not because God has suddenly overextended himself financially and he needs our help. God doesn't need you and me, actually. I'm going to tell you that. For everlast from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. He doesn't need our money. The cattle on a thousand hills belongs to the Lord. Psalm 24 verse 1, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. He doesn't need anything. We are the ones who need food, we need water, we need light, we need oxygen. What else do we need? We need company, all right? You put yourself on a desert island. Go. That's why they put people into solitary confinement. It's a we need to interact with people. It's a need. And so Paul is trying to say, when you and I put money into the offertory banks, 
It's worship, church. Okay? God is not interested in, or God is not impressed when we put a lot of money and oh, I hope you see, Lord, how much I'm giving you. God is not impressed. Remember that in the Gospels, there was a lady who put two copper coins and then Jesus told his disciples, that lady has given more. Voila, all these rich people gave so much. He said, yeah. But she gave all that she had to live on. I'm not saying that we have to do that. But if the Lord leads you to do that, you work it out before God. But that is worship. You know, so often in the church, when we have the offer tree, we treat it as something like, Kela, we have to do it. Nah? Actually, it is just as important as what we did just now, as our brother was leading in worship. This is worship. When we pay our tithes and our offerings, it's worship. Next slide. In this verse, I would like you to memorize. And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Let's read it together. Ready, one, two. <laughs> so although the Philippians had given sacrificially in their poverty, Paul was confident and he wanted them to be confident that God would supply whatever was needed for them financially. But so often when we read this verse, we only think in terms of finances. <laughs> but actually this verse, when the Bible says God will supply all our needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus, all right, it would also include that even as the Philippians were going through persecution, God would supply what was necessary for them to stand firm, stand united, and stand courageous. Remember, we saw that chapter 1 and verse 27 to 30. God would help them as they battle the disunity and the self-centeredness. God would provide them with his grace and humility that if they exercise that grace and humility there would be healing and reconciliation and we've seen that in Philippians chapter 2 verses 1 to 5 and chapter 4 2 to 3 and when the false teachers were coming in God would provide them with the necessary wisdom God would provide them, sorry, God would provide them with the necessary wisdom to say no to the false teachers, to say no to the false teaching, and to continue following Christ. And whenever they felt like giving up, God, God the Father himself would gently nudge them, gently push them forward, to keep on pressing the race, pressing on with the race. Philippians chapter 3 verses 12 to 14. Not that I have already obtained all this, or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. And Paul goes on to say, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. God will provide the necessary tenacity, the necessary stamina, and the necessary push to go on until we walk into the presence of God. Finally, no matter how challenging the situation, God's unquenchable joy, God's joy that transcends all human understanding will be made available. God will provide. And my God will supply all your needs. 
In other words, in three words, God is enough. And everybody said, God is enough. And at this point, suddenly Paul moves into worship. Next slide, please. I'm almost done. Now to our God and Father, be the glory forever and ever. Amen. He's just overflowing. Next slide. Now he comes to the greetings. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. You must remember he's in Rome, and so he always, Paul normally ends his letters with greetings. So he says, especially those of Caesar's household. What does it mean? That means there were people within the imperial palace, in Caesar's palace. We don't know who they are. Could be maybe the cooks, could be the maids, it could be maybe some, some of the royal imperial family. We don't know. All he says, people in Caesar's household greet you. Wow! The gospel had reached the emperor. Even if he hadn't given his life to Christ yet, I mean, that will take a few more hundred years, a few hundred years. But what was important, the gospel had reached the most influential place in the Roman Empire, the imperial palace. This in and of itself is, was reason for much joy and thanksgiving. And finally, Paul ends, next slide please, Paul ends with a, with a, with a blessing, or what we call a benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. How do you apply all this? And then I will close. All right? Open your Bibles now. Now you must open your Bibles. Very quickly. I, I won't take long, but I want to bring this out. Okay, Matthew chapter 6. Let me read to you from verse 19. Matthew, just open your Bibles. Matthew chapter 6, reading from verse 19. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. Okay, I don't need to explain that. This is so simple. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If my treasure is in my bank account, my heart will be in the bank account. It's as simple as that. But if my treasure is in Christ, we sang that song just now, knowing you, Jesus, knowing you, there is no greater thing. Remember we sang that song? And if Jesus Christ is our treasure, our heart is there with him. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Verse 22. And then suddenly, it took me years, I couldn't understand this. Suddenly he starts talking like this, this is our Lord. The eye is the lamp of the body, so then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be clear, full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? And for years I used to scratch my head. He's talking about money and pattern. Suddenly he talks about I bright, I bad. And then verse 24. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So what is he talking about good eye, bad eye? 
And then what? I one day I learned. Next slide. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. Jesus is not referring to these eyes. Rather, he's using the word eye as a metaphor. A person with a good eye is a person who is generous and kind to others. He is a person or she is a person who is focused on being kind to others, compassionate and willing to give money, time, energy, abilities to serve God for His glory alone. It is one who is focused on God. Next slide. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. The bad eye, Proverbs calls it the evil eye, refers to one who is self-centered and stingy. That's, that's what it is. If I'm the type who is calculative, Jesus says, your whole being, your whole spirit being is dark. We can go through the motions of singing the hymns, singing the songs, taking communion, but if our hearts, if we are just being very calculative with God, what Jesus is saying is that very honestly our attitude to money affects the altitude on which we can soar with the Lord. I know this is painful teaching. I'll be honest with you, I sometimes I wish it wasn't here. But it is the fact. If we let money be be our master. It becomes like a chain that even when you want to soar, chain you fall down. Have you seen dogs on a chain? They go, wah, wah. no, no, sorry, that's a wrong sound. Wah, wah, wah. And they, wah, wah, wah. they go back. That's precisely what will happen to us. If money is what runs our heart, we cannot soar. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall rise up on wings as eagles. Why is it often we cannot soar? Can I suggest to you, based on these passages, let's check our heart's attitude towards wealth and money. Next slide. And so Paul, and so Jesus concludes, if therefore the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? You see, church, the evil eye or the bad eye of selfish materialism is very toxic to our relationship with God. Our stingy and greedy attitude towards wealth and possessions can also potentially destroy what it is that makes us human. In the book of Psalms, it is written that, you know, this is what a person who makes an idol and he carves it and all, and the maker becomes like the idol, and those who worship him, worship the idol, become like the idol. Now, if our idol is money, can I say this? we will become cold and hard and lifeless like money. You may be surprised to know that something like 40% of the parables of Christ had to do with wealth and our attitudes towards it. Amazing. He spoke a lot about wealth. 
I'm not saying we all should give up our money and all that stuff. Then you and God work it out. What I am saying to you and to myself, we need to check our attitudes towards money. That despite all the problems that in the church, the Philippian believers were generous to the point of being sacrificial. They had good eyes. Let us follow their example. Amen? Next slide. God is enough. Amen? Let's read it together. Ready? One, two. God is enough. How many of you believe that? Don't put up your hands. Don't put up your hands. How many of you believe that? God is enough. And I pray for each one of us, including myself, that we can honestly say that with our hearts. Oh Lord, you are enough. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this time. Father, we ask that you would bring us to this point when we can say that you are you alone are enough. Or oh, in the words of the hymn, Thou, O Christ, art all I want, all I need in thee I find. That we would find everything we need, that you are our sufficiency, that in you we have all that we need. And if there is any need, you will provide for it. O oh God, bring us as a church, O oh Lord, Gregia Emmanuel Moi, the church where the Lord is with us. That we would know because the Lord is with us, with each one of us, that we can lean on you. That even though we may walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will not fear any evil. Whatever that shadow may be, whatever that valley may be, because your rod and your staff will comfort us. Your very presence will take us step by step. Lord, many things about tomorrow we don't understand. But we want to say, oh Lord, but we know you hold our tomorrows and you hold our hands. And because of that, we can go forward trusting in you. So bring us to that point, oh Lord, when we can say with confidence, God, oh God, you are enough. Thank you and bless you, Jesus' name. Amen. And now may the grace of God the Father, the love of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit remain with us now and forever. Serve the Lord with gladness and rejoicing. God bless you all. Good night.